I guess I do want to say that this subspecialty, as many as many subspecialties, definitely requires an interest and a passion for the patient population and setting because there is a lot of, of difficulty working with substance use disorders. And so I definitely think it's an area where there's not enough providers who are treating um, addiction. There's a great need. And I think an FNP can very nicely transition into this area to provide a lot of much needed services. Creating a meaningful career as a new nurse practitioner presents many challenges, and there are myriad ways to learn from the journey taken by others. Let's talk all about nurse practitioners and what this exciting and varied career path can truly be with my guest, Claire Afwa Ellerbrock, DNP, right here on episode 373 of The Nurse Keith Show. Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. This podcast is all about you, your personal and professional development, your career, and the healthcare system as a whole. And I'm here to share education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews like today's with some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, nursing, entrepreneurship, medicine, and beyond. I love having you along for the ride, and I thank you from the bottom of my nurse podcaster's heart, the bottom of my nurse podcaster's heart, for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. And if you'd like to help other people find the show, please consider leaving a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other podcast app you use. I'd appreciate it so much. And if you'd like to become a patron, head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith and check it out. And finally, please head over to nursekeith.com to find the show notes for this episode. And like I said, we're here today with Claire Afwa Ellerbrock, nurse practitioner. And Claire, I'm so glad you're here with me. And we're going to talk about a lot of different things today. But I want to jump right into this somewhat non-traditional route you took to become a nurse practitioner. So where, where did your slightly circuitous route take you on the way to becoming an NP? Sure. Well, first, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I, I didn't always know I wanted to go into nursing. I have an undergraduate bachelor's degree in psychology from Washington University in St. Louis. And when I was in college, I was always interested in how our thoughts and our mood have such a huge influence on what it is that we do. And I was curious about how really distinctly our our mental health and our physical health are treated in society. And I was really just drawn towards my abnormal psychology class in college. I was fascinated by it. And so I initially thought I wanted to pursue a career in research. And I had spent several summers during my time in college working as a research assistant in the school's department of psychology. Hmm. Um, Over time, I, I realized my senior year that I wanted to have a bit more interaction with with kind of the people I was helping and on a more one-on-one level. And that sort of led me to consider nursing. So I I finished my bachelor's degree in St. Louis and I moved to Cleveland and I did an accelerated bachelor of arts to a a BSN equivalent degree at Case Western. Um, And it was during my nursing school rotations that I really gravitated towards my psych rotation. I just felt very comfortable and just authentically myself and just liked working with the patients. And, and so when I graduated from nursing school, instead of following that, that one you recommended of working on a med surge unit, I dove straight into to inpatient um, behavioral health. And I worked there for a few years seeing patients. And at the same time, I went on to obtain my, to work on my MSN to become a psych NP. And my first job was two years in a community mental health uh, setting. And from there, I've had the opportunity to have really a range of, of different work experiences. Hmm. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. So the there's a couple things I want to ask you about that. So the first thing is when you were doing, um, you were working as a research assistant, right? Mm-hmm. And that was in, in psychology. Did you have interaction with patients? And was that part of the like the impetus to be like, oh yeah, I really like working with people directly. A little bit. So I was, I was kind of just an assistant to the principal investigator of the studies and it was very kind of minimal interactions with just kind of providing instructions and um, 
brief interactions with with kind of the studies or research subjects were college students. Um, and so just really brief and minimal. And I, I, I could see myself working down the road in research, but kind of in a more removed way. And so kind of writing papers and just behind the scenes in academia. And I was finding I, I wanted more individualized connection. I wanted more one-on-one, less kind of abstract removed. I wanted to be kind of, yeah, working one-on-one. Yeah. And there's, there's something about your journey that reminds me of mine, which is that mm-hmm. you said that when you finished your, your accelerated RN program, you didn't do the traditional, like get a year in med surge and you went directly into inpatient psych, if I remember what you said correctly, Correct. yes, yes, which is what I years. did, but I just went directly into community health out, you know, working in a, in a federally qualified health center. In, with underserved populations. So that is a real red flag and trigger for a lot of people when one of us finishes nursing school and doesn't go into acute care or med surge or telemetry or something. Did you get a lot of pushback about that? And did you have any doubts that came up for you when you made that decision? Sure. So. I, there wasn't really pushback. If anything, it was just kind of internal, I would assume. Um, I know there's really a, a narrative where um, in nursing, there's a very clear structure of what a person should do, which is that you're in that surge or acute care or critical care and, and to kind of not lose those skills. But I, I knew that I, I wanted to go into psych. That was my interest. I was kind of following where my interest was and for me, it was quite an easy decision to say, hey, this is where my interest lies. I'm going to kind of dive in head first. And so, um, yeah, I don't think there was really pushback recommendations to, to kind of consider it, but I think it was, it was pretty clear for me and it wasn't, it wasn't such a tough decision. And I've kind of stuck in this lane of, of psych since that point. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And it doesn't sound like you're stuck. It sounds like you're happily in that lane. Oh, absolutely. And I, yeah. and I think having gone on to be a psych NP, there's so many different avenues a psych NP can subspecialize. Um, and so there are many, many, many options, but I think there's, there's a need for a lot of different, um, care providers and, and, um, following our passions for where we're genuinely interested, I think will lead to, to the best outcomes for patients and for us as providers too. I think you're right. Yeah. I made the same choice and never looked back though. Everyone told me it was professional suicide, but you know, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> so I'm glad you didn't get the pushback I got, which was mm-hmm. pretty vehement. Um, one of the things that you and I ch- chatted about already and that I wanted to touch on today was that you were saying that, that well, we agreed together that FNPs sometimes have trouble finding their niche. And I shared with you in our previous conversation offline that I hear from a lot of people who chose to become an FNP because they wanted to serve patients, you know, in a more profound way in terms of being a prescriber and having that kind of authority. But then they find that they're stuck in this like 15 minute see the patient, go to the next patient, go to the next patient model. Mm -hmm. And they feel like they're being forced to be a doctor or a mini doctor when they know they're actually not a mini doctor. They're actually a nurse who has this advanced training. And it's still a holistic type of um, way of looking at patient care. But when they're this square peg being pounded into this medical model round hole, it can feel really uncomfortable. And I hear from a lot of newish NPs or FNPs who feel like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? So what's your feeling about that, especially as someone, and we'll talk about the ways in which you support new NPs, like what, what can they do and where can they turn? And do you hear similar stories? Yeah, I, I, I do think there's this time crunch probably well, really, really across specialties where we're expected to see more patients and a in a shorter amount of time. Um, but, but definitely with, in my experience first as as a psych NP, I'll say that there's many different options of avenues of subspecializing. So as a psych NP, um, one can work with eating disorders or, um, with addictions or providing childcare 
or community mental health or correctional facilities. There's many different avenues. And, and I think for an F and P can be a little bit tougher to find kind of a sub niche. Mm -hmm. I think one that is more, um, maybe not looked over, but, but one that there is a lot of opportunity for those that are interested is in addictions, um, particularly with treating opioid use disorders um, to address the opioid epidemic. Um, an FNP or a psych NP could get certified to become a prescriber to treat opioid use disorder. And it involves um, training. Um, and one can get, can get this training through various organizations. One of them is the American Society of Addiction Medicine, for a physician, it's eight hours of training for a nurse practitioner. It's 24 hours. But through this training, you then get what's called an X waiver through the DEA. And it allows you to prescribe the Schedule 3 substance, buprenorphine, also known as Suboxone. Um, and then after that, one works with an experienced clinician who is trained in addiction um, to then hone skills and then work in what's called a medication assisted treatment program or a MAP program. Right. And this allows one to prescribe the medication and then also work with wraparound services of addiction counselors and peer specialists and to kind of get extra support. But um, this is one particular path an FNP could take if they're really passionate about, about substance use disorders and, and treating it. I guess I do want to say that this subspecialty, as many as many subspecialties definitely requires an interest and a passion for the patient population and setting, because there is a lot of, of difficulty working with substance use disorders. And so I definitely think it's an area where there's not enough providers who are treating um, addiction. There's a great need. And I think an F and P can very nicely transition into this area to provide a lot of much needed services. Mm. And it, it is, I mean, it's it's straightforward, but then it's again, it's not because people who are receiving that often have a lot of other accompanying psychosocial issues that need to be mm -hmm. dealt with. Could be housing, could be violence in the home, could be poverty, could be all sorts of things. So it's not just like writing a script and sending them on their way because you, like you said, there's wraparound services. So it can be kind of holistic, but there's there's a lot of moving parts to providing that, right? Absolutely. And and I would say on top of that, other co-occurring co mental health conditions. And so the person might not just struggle with opioid use disorder, but also concurrent depression or bipolar disorder also. And I think the emphasis is on being in a MAP program. Sometimes there are prescribers who, who just um, prescribe Suboxone. There's not kind of the wraparound programming of medication-assisted treatment programming surrounding it. Mm -hmm. And so someone who's pursuing this, it would be great to work in a setting where there are structures of support, where there are social workers, there are addiction counselors and peer specialists to help um, provide more holistic care to patients because it's not just the medication. It's kind of these other services too that would help a patient do better in recovery than just receiving the medication. Right, right. And just to clarify, you don't have to be a psych NP to do MAT. You can be an FNP and you can get this waiver. So you don't have to have that specific psych background. Correct. Yeah, yes, which is, that is great. Correct. That's great because we need more providers and that opens things up. Now, as a, as a, a nurse practitioner who actually supports other nurse practitioners and your website is NP4NPs and that's F-O-R, not the number four, NP4NPs.com. Yes. You talk to a lot of nurse practitioners, people reach out to you. And what are some of the other, let's say common concerns that you hear from NPs entering practice, whether it's psych, FNP, mm -hmm. women's health, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. what are common, what are the threads that get woven through these conversations that you have? Yeah, I would say a, a big one is not feeling like there's a lot of support once entering the role. So, so clinical support mm -hmm. of, of how to prescribe or how to handle um, difficult patients or patients who aren't um, responding to treatment or are wanting certain medications. I would say in, in my lane of, of psych, I have a lot of, I have a few psych students and or psych new grads. And, and I think dealing with patients with boundaries of, 
you know, wanting certain medications, certain controlled substances and not knowing how to handle that is, is something I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Um, I would also say concern about there being a saturated market. So students who are finishing school and wanting to enter the workforce and feeling concerned about finding jobs is another one. And I would also say with something that I really talk about is negotiating job offer contracts. And so that's something that not, not a lot of people do anyway, and especially a new grad doesn't do. And so a lot of what I do is, is trying to help NPs recognize their value and and teaching how to um, effectively negotiate at the beginning, even in a first job. That's really good. And what are some of the main points around negotiating? Like what, what, um, can a, a new NP bring to the table when they're trying to negotiate? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's certain, I kind of describe a framework of steps to take when we're negotiating a job offer contract. Mm-hmm. So the first is obviously getting the offer first. We don't want to be negotiating before we've been formally um, given a job. And so we first thank the prospective employer for the 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 job offer and we review the contract and, and get a sense of what it involves. We also want to understand that there's other negotiables beyond what's just in the offer contract. And so just because something isn't listed doesn't mean it's not negotiable. Things like your employer paying for your DEA license mm. or having your work schedule uh, rearranged in somewhat non-traditional ways. Um, so there are other things besides salary that are negotiable and and that's important to know what they are. And then comes the point of finding a point of a priority kind of there there should be a couple things that are your top priorities of importance of what you want to negotiate. We obviously can't negotiate everything under the sun, but there, if there are a couple key things that are important to you, coming to a conversation with the prospective employer, whether via phone or email or in person, and saying if this is the case that you are excited about the position, there are just a couple things that you're hoping to discuss to come to a mutual agreement so that you can come on board. And I think it really. I mean, hopefully by this point, the interview was a period of time where you're able to describe why you're a good fit um, for the position and discussing your experiences as an RN and your clinical rotation experiences as an NP student. Um, By the point we're talking about negotiation, this involves trying to come to mutual agreement. And um, there's a lot of back and forth involved with it too. But the final step after that conversation occurs is to have someone else also review your offer contract to make sure it's a good fit, whether it's a nurse attorney or a family member or trusted colleague. But um, I think negotiation is something that doesn't always come up because it seems as a new grad that there's not really grounds to negotiate. And that's not necessarily the case. Right. Because they probably really need you. And sometimes you can't negotiate salary, but you can negotiate vacation time. And like you said, schedule, maybe, um, you know, other aspects that they do add up over time. Like if you can negotiate an extra week of vacation a year, I mean, that, that means something. So sometimes salary won't budge, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or absolutely. Like, like, um, as I mentioned before, having your DEA license paid for it's Mm -hmm. renewed every three years and currently it's $888. That's not a small expense Yeah. or sign on bonuses or a you know, loan forgiveness I've seen also Mm -hmm. after a period of time being employed. And so there's a lot of other creative ways um, where you can come to potential agreement when an employer won't budge on certain things like salary sometimes. Yeah. And NPs who are struggling with this transition to practice, you know, maybe they've been a nurse for, I don't know, eight years, two years, maybe they just finished nursing school and went straight to become an NP. Um, Do you find there's some imposter syndrome that happens because all of a sudden they're prescribing and they have, you know, the, I mean, the level of responsibility really Mm -hmm. goes up astronomically from RN to FNP or psych NP. So is it sometimes difficult for individuals to just Except that they're now this, you know, much more robust provider who can do a lot more and holds more responsibility. Is that is that hard? Absolutely. That was something I certainly struggled with, and the NPs that I that I talked to also struggle with. I think it's something that 
is common and, and that we all experience. I think for me, at least what happened over time was kind of getting validation from my peers that I was working with. And I'm kind of, I'm, it's normal to be feeling unsure and, and doubtful, but you know, you're on the right track. And then over time, kind of getting that reassurance from patients in terms of their, their outcomes of them, their depression, improving their psychosis, lessening, mm-hmm. kind of seeing that reflected. And then when I, my first job, when I left it after two years, I, I had patients that were surprised that I was leaving, that I was sad that I was leaving and would tell me that I was a helpful provider and it helped them through some difficult times. And that's not something you always hear from a patient day to day, at least not, not me. And so kind of getting that validation that like, okay, you know, I am a good provider. I belong here and where I should be. That was something that came over time from different, different avenues. And uh, it's certainly something that I think is, is common for all NPs to experience. I think that'd be odd or concerning if there wasn't that, that concern. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. You know, when we come back from the break, I want to talk about your, F, your NP for NPs side hustle, your business that you work and the course that you have for new NPs. And I also want to talk about your thoughts regarding the DNP and the trend towards you know, moving in that kind of doctoral direction. And I also want to talk about your interests and experience in working with underserved populations and minorities and how you see the role of the NP in that particular realm. And, and I just wanted to say that, you know, in looking over um, in terms of NPs and the demand for NPs, I mean, in ter- terms of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, I mean, they're projecting... 45% job growth for NPs until 2030 and like 4% for MDs. So there's there's something going on. So I think, you know, it's important for NPs to realize that the need is out there or those who want to become NPs. So does that sound like a good group of um, grouping of ideas and concepts to talk about when we come back? That sounds great. All right. So we will be right back with the second half of episode 373 of the Nurse Keith Show with Claire Afwa Ellerbrock. Hey, everyone. Let's take a quick pause for the cause, shall we? Thanks for being a valued listener of the Nurse Keith Show. And if you'd like to help other people find the podcast, please consider leaving a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. This really helps propel the show and grow our audience, and I truly appreciate everyone who's already taken the time. And if leaving a public rating review isn't your thing, why not tell a colleague about the Nurse Keith Show by sending them a link so they can listen for themselves? After all, word of mouth is the most organic way for me to reach those who truly need to tune in. So if you'd like to do me a solid, please consider leaving a rating review or telling a friend or colleague. And by doing so, you'll be helping the Nurse Keith Show reach more and more nurses and healthcare professionals all around the world. Now, let's get back to today's conversation. And welcome back to the second half of the episode. We're here again with friend of the pod, Claire Afwa Ellerbrock. And Claire, prior to the break, we were talking about, well, the potential for imposter syndrome with a new NP because you know you're taking on this new responsibility and you can feel like wow you know <laughs> all of a sudden here I am like this prescribing you know provider with all this power and authority and that can be really challenging and we talked about medication assisted treatment Matt and how getting that X waiver can be a really good uh, way for an NP to find a a niche that is really useful at this time in our society and um, the need is out there. And we also talked about your non-traditional route, which I think is important to point out that we don't all have to take the tried and true route to get to where we are or where we want to be. And first I want to talk about NP for NPs. So what was the impetus to create the website and then create the course, the transition of practice course that you have out there and that we, I encourage people to check out. Yeah. So I had a particularly difficult time transitioning into practice and I can share a little bit more about that, but in retrospect, also after 
after a couple years in practice talking to coworkers and new grads coming after me, I was realizing that the difficulty I experienced was experienced in in those, you know, peers and colleagues as well. Um, and so for me, I, I think I'm someone who is very um, future oriented and proactive with planning, and I I just wasn't expecting the the steep learning curve that I experienced entering practice. Um, it definitely is, as you mentioned, it's 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 a completely different role going from from an RN to someone who's more of a leader who's um, in charge and responsible for a patient and managing medications and having a team around you and not only learning to diagnose and prescribe, but also balancing charting and finishing that and making sure that you are, um, you know, balancing interpreting labs and returning phone calls and um, maintaining therapeutic rapport with patients, not giving too much of yourself. There's just a lot of new skills that a new grad is learning all at once. And, um, you know, in school, you're learning so many things that you can't possibly learn all of these things. Some things are learned in the job, but it was definitely just, it was a rougher transition for me. And I, I didn't feel the support I needed. And I think as a result, I was feeling burnout earlier in my career than I was expecting. And I think some of that was just the roughness of my transition. And so that sort of led me to create this business called NP for NPs, Nurtured Path for Nurse Practitioners, to provide some sort of very proactive, structured support of kind of what needs to be done from just before graduation through a first job to really enter practice feeling more confident and supported entering practice. And the, and the key group of people who you're really trying to reach are those who are in their final year, more or less, and yeah. are on their way to finishing, getting licensed, getting their first job as an NP, and then launching that practice, right? That's really the niche for you. Correct. I would say a final semester nurse practitioner. Final student. semester. Correct. Okay. And it's across the board of specialties because all NP specialties struggle. But I think from a place of being proactive, you can anticipate challenges better than when someone is a couple months after graduation and trying to find a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those the NP pathways, they've been consolidated and changed somewhat over the last, I don't know how many years, right? So when now we have women's health nurse practitioner, right? Mm -hmm. WHNP. And then we have family nurse practitioner, obviously. And we have psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. And then we have adult gerontological nurse practitioner, right? Are those mm -hmm. the four main pathways now or is there a fifth one that i'm overlooking there's, there's pediatrics Pe oh yeah how could i forget pediatrics um, yeah and then we have certified nurse midwives correct right who are graduate level nurses who work specifically in that particular area so how, how could i forget pediatrics how correct. Could I nurse anesthetists but i guess that's its own sort of <laughs> realm yeah that's a whole nother world um <laughs> But they are considered APRNs. They don't. I don't hear them referred to as like nurse practitioners per Correct. se. But Correct. They, APRNs. Well, yeah. But not NPs. Yeah. So those are the areas that they've all been sort of consolidated into now. Um, and sorry, PD nurse practitioners. It's just <laughs> kind of like my just my brain just blanked out for a second. But this is my brain on fifty-seven. You know. Um, so we have these these groupings, and then we have all the like, um, what do you call them? Postgraduate certificates. So an NP can get a postgraduate certificate in cardiology and nephrology. And, you know, so someone who gets an FNP degree who realizes, you know, I don't really want to do this 15 minute internal medicine family practice kind of thing, which can get really frustrating pretty fast. That's what I've observed. Can an FNP then get that postgraduate certificate in one of those areas? Uh, in psych, I know. And, and I know a little bit less about the family NP track than I do with about the psych track, which, which is my background. Mm -hmm. But yes, a, a family nurse practitioner can get a postmaster's certification in something like psych yeah. and, and be able to, to treat you know, more mental health conditions. Yeah. And I know a lot of FNPs can specialize in women's health and they don't even necessarily need to go back and get a postmaster certificate. They can mm -hmm. 
maybe work side by side with a mm-hmm. women's health provider, whether another NP or an or a, a, a um, obst- obstetrician, for instance, mm-hmm. and just kind of get the grounding in those sort in those types of um, that form of practice, and just work with women and women's health specifically. So an FNP does have some latitude. They don't have to work at internal medicine in you know like a clinic or a doctor's office, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is where I feel like a lot of new FNPs tend to get stuck and they feel like there's nowhere to turn. And that's where I'm Mm going to send them to you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, I certainly, um, my, my course kind of walks through some of the logistical steps, uh, a new grad needs to take. And so it's, it's broken up into eight modules. And the first is all about getting board certified and then licensed in your particular state. And, um, in that period, there's so much that's occurring as you're studying for boards, but when you're applying for boards and you're applying for your license, there's all kinds of documentation that's required to be provided. And sometimes the turnaround time is slow. And if you have a job waiting for you, that all needs to be kind of streamlined. And so my course kind of involves that first part is all about getting those processes set. Um, the next is the next module is all about finding kind of the right fit. And so the right type of work setting you want to work in and kind of red flags to avoid in a job interview. Mm -hmm. Um, The next module is all about interviewing. And so what questions you need to ask to make sure that you are effectively interviewing the employer as well, because it's not just a one-way street, it's two. And so interviewing and um, resume adjustments, the next is all about negotiating job offer contracts and then collaborative care and understanding the nature of the various relationships you'll have. The first being with your collaborating provider. If you live in a state that requires one, navigating relationships with your your team, your nurse and other staff members and patients. And then there's a module all about time management and making sure that you are utilizing your time effectively. One of the biggest areas is that slows us down as NPs is charting and mm, making sure yes. that we're understanding how to chart appropriately and manage your time effectively. And then lastly, the module, the last module is about um, avoiding burnout proactively um, because that's something that us as nurses and NPs experience. And um, my goal is to address that proactively so that we're not experiencing that. And so um, those are kind of the logistical things that my course tackles to help, to help a student. That sounds great. And I'm sure it's not the last course you're going to create, but if this is the first um, your flagship course that you've created for new to practice NPs, right? And you said kind of like last semester of NP school is sort of a sweet spot. Yeah, I, I'm in the process of creating a course for um, psych NPs and family NPs interested in psych to um, to treat mental health conditions. And so um, depression, anxiety, and psychosis. So an FNP in a rural setting will be able to have this tool to more, more effectively treat mental health and so um, kind of a crash course in that to provide additional support. That sounds great. And now I want to pick your brain about something else that is, I just feel like the, the internet's all a buzz about it because there's lots of articles about it. And there's a lot of questions from NPs and those who are beginning to decide the direction they want to take with their career, their graduate career. Mm -hmm. And that is the DNP degree. So most of us know, if we haven't been hiding under a rock, that the DNP has become a real thing. And there's always been the PhD track, right? You can go and you can do research and all sorts of stuff and get your doctorate in nursing, get a PhD and write a dissertation and everything. So that's always been there. That's been there a really long time. And we also know that physical therapy has turned in that direction. So I don't know what year it actually started. And I know the the older PTs, the PTs had gone to school before were grandfathered in. Mm -hmm. However, PTs now need to get a doctorate in order to even practice. And I just keep feeling like nursing is heading in that direction. I don't know if it ever will actually get there. But what's your feeling about the DNP degree and this trend towards requiring it or kind of um, leaning in that direction? And what are you what are you hearing through the grapevine about this whole DNP thing? 
Yeah. So, so I have my DNP and, and just a, a side note, I don't know if we kind of covered or has been discussed the difference between a PhD track and a DNP. PhD is all about research and generating new knowledge to mm-hmm. add to the field where the DNP is applying the knowledge that's learned in an evidence-based way, doing things like quality improvement. And so um, I, I have my DNP and I think first it's important to really understand a person should know why they're they're going to obtain a DNP. That's really key um, before kind of just jumping in and getting one. Um, I've learned over time that I am a lifelong student. I love learning. I love being surrounded by students who are also pursuing the same goal. And so after two years of working as an NP for me, I became more restless and I wanted to return to kind of a structured environment of, um, of learning in kind of structured way. And so Um, that was one of the reasons that led me to obtain a DNP. I also wanted to open up myself to opportunities to possibly teach one day. And a part of me thought that in the future, there is a trend that, um, employers might be preferential towards NPs who have their DNP. And so Mm -hmm. it was for all of those reasons that kind of led me to, to obtain my DNP. And so I think having a first understanding of what your reasons are is, is really important, and then just a bit more just about the kind of curriculum for the DNP. It's, it's really great for, for kind of gaining skills and leadership and organizational and systems changes. And so coursework includes things like quality improvement for healthcare delivery, population health, organizational systems, um, advanced leadership in healthcare. And, um, you know, if you're interested in those things, I think going towards the DNP absolutely makes sense. Um, to your point about, you know, requirements for getting it, I, I think I think we're moving in the direction that maybe 10, 15, 20 years, it might be something that's more required. But I, I think there's a more subtle trend that NPs with a DNP degree may be preferred over candidates for positions where all else is equal between the two candidates. And so I don't think that there'll be like a, a hard and fast, you need to have it. But I, I think there may there might be kind of just a preference towards it. And I think having a broader way of, of thinking the ability to make, you know, systems changes in an organization is a beneficial skill. Maybe the way an NP is utilized may differ down the road with not just seeing patients, but being expected to participate more in a systems level way of, of making changes in an organization may be expected. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't think that an NP currently should make the decision of, of getting a DNP, DNP out of fear of them not being selected for a job. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, that's all really helpful to hear. And it, it's sort of like the RN and BSN thing where, you know, nurses with ADNs are kind of getting shut out of acute care. Mm-hmm. And it's not like it's been said that you have to have a BSN, but it's just become a preference in acute care, especially since that Institute of Medicine report that came out some years ago. So it's just a trend. And this is a trend we're seeing with advanced practice nurses. And I think you're right that, and people who are pursuing this area of practice need to think carefully about why they're doing it. And I think your points about credibility and marketability are well taken. And also looking towards the future is also a point well taken. So we we just have to um, we just have to watch the trends as they as they continue and just see what see where it heads. So we'll we'll see. But I, I appreciate your input on that. So thank you. Sure. I I wanted to delve a little bit into before we wrap up into this whole area of treating underserved populations and your interest in that area. And you just did a recent travel NP work, locum tenens work at a tribal clinic for the Ojibwe tribe in Northern mm-hmm. Wisconsin. And that was through the Indian Health Service. And where where does all this fit into your your identity and your your kind of like what you want to accomplish as a clinician and why treating underserved populations and minorities is so important to you. Yeah. So I've, I've always been passionate about treating minority populations, underserved patient populations, 
there is a disparity in health outcomes and healthcare access and delivery among disadvantaged patient populations. And so for me, working to address this by providing quality patient care to these populations is something I've always loved. Um, I think personally, I'm, I'm a minority. My mom is West African. She's from Ghana. My dad is white. And I know that whenever I go to a healthcare provider, it's, it's, it's nice to see someone who might share a small similarity in, in terms of maybe experiences or the way I look. And I wonder if other patients um, might find comfort in that, um, you know, having that shared, you know, shared similarity, um, because that's, that's not always something that a, a a patient can relate to a provider on. And especially in, in psych, you're sharing a lot of vulnerable information and being able to relate to the provider you're talking to is important. Mm-hmm. And so I, uh, yeah, I've, I've just been drawn to, to providing care to, to minorities and just underserved populations. And that's what really led me to work at this American Indian um, tribal clinic. And that was a very neat experience learning about a very different culture and I was experiencing a bit of burnout before going to the assignment and I sort of was unexpectedly surprised at just how, um, um, how meaningful and and kind of purposeful that experience was for me. And so it's, it's a, um, it's work that I love to do and it was a very neat experience. Hmm. Well, that's lovely. And what are your plans at this juncture in terms of that particular part of your desire to serve do you have ideas about what you might like to accomplish in the next in the coming years do you have your sight set on something very specific or is it more sort of this general desire um so i want to continue treating patients um seeing patients working with underserved patient populations um i also want to help um new NPs transition into practice. I think I have a bigger impact. I'm able to reach many more people by helping equip new NPs with the tools to go out and and provide care to other patient populations. And so uh, I think I see my work pivoting into helping mentor, you know, new grads and helping new grads kind of make that transition into practice to go out and help other, other, other patients. Yeah. And maybe you can also have an impact on new NP grads in terms of your passion for health equity and your passion for serving underserved populations and minorities and, you know, providing high quality mental health care. You know, there's, there's a lot of room for that in the United States. And I think Mm -hmm. if, these NPs come to you and they take your course and they have conversations with you and then look to you as a mentor, you could have a lot of impact in terms of the choices they make and kind of plant these little seeds in their minds and their hearts about, you know, marginalized populations and the ways in which they could serve, you know, the people who need them most. So I think it puts you in this great position to have this, you know, kind of a, a really profound impact on the way people think about what they might accomplish, right? I hope so. I, mm-hmm. I certainly want to help NPs feel empowered in their own value to go out and do what they feel um, lights them up, whether it's working with you know addiction. There's many other areas where there's underserved populations. And so um, the primary goal is, is helping create agency and empowerment for NPs to go out and then do what work they feel most called to do. That's really great. And um, I appreciate that. And we definitely want to send people over to your website to npfornps.com and to check out your course and your Facebook page and Instagram and connect with you on LinkedIn. And I always tell my listeners to send a personalized invitation to connect if they look you up on LinkedIn. That's one of the pieces of homework I give listeners. Yeah. And I have four questions I ask all of my guests these days. Are you up for playing a little game? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Okay. So the first question, and this might have to do with maybe some of the ways in which you talk with these new NPs. And the question is, how do you define success? What does that really mean to you in life? I think success is liking what you're doing, the way you're doing it and how you're doing it. Mm. I think that's, I'm paraphrasing a Maya Angelou 
quote, but it's, it's simple and it's, it's very, it, it can certainly change over time. But I think those, those three components really guide a person towards what, what success is. And I think in, in nursing, there's so many different ways to, um, to achieve success. And that's definitely very individualized. Yeah. And you didn't mention a million dollars in the bank or anything like that, or, <laughs> you know, three car garage, you mentioned, it sounds like being satisfied and happy and fulfilled in what you do. That's where mm-hmm. you're coming from. Yeah. What you do, how you do it, the way you do it. Yes. Yeah. I like that. Thank you. And yeah. how would you describe one person who's inspired you in the course of your life? They can be living or dead and they can be famous or not famous. Who would that person be? Just mm-hmm. one person. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would say it is my older brother. Mm-hmm. His name's David and he is an engineer by by trade and an entrepreneur currently. And I am inspired by him because he makes decisions and lives his life based on his how he feels, his intuition. There's not really, there's not really his decisions aren't made based on what society thinks or what what anyone thinks other than himself. And I think that message of following what you desire and looking inward is really key, something I need to be reminded to do. And so my brother, David is, is definitely the person that comes to mind. That's really nice. I've, I've heard, um, grandmother several times and someone I interviewed recently mentioned their wife, but I haven't heard sibling yet. That's really sweet. Mm. I really like that. That's really nice. I'm glad to have a sibling in the mix. Um, the next question is what's that? I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm lucky. He's, he's yeah. I, I just said, I'm, I'm lucky. He's, he's a great support. Yeah, I'm sure. And the next one is, is there a book or a movie that's had a major impact on the way you think or the way you live your life? And it doesn't have to be an absolute favorite because that's often hard to nail down, but just one that comes to mind mm-hmm. that's just like, has a lot of meaning for you. Um, there are a couple. I'll, I'll list the first one that I'm reading right now. It's called Rejection Proof by mm-hmm. Jia Zhang. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but um, it is a book about a person who has gone on this hundred day journey of being rejected, doing different activities to induce rejection each day in order to become more re- resilient against it. And I think fear of rejection keeps us from doing things, making choices, taking actions very often in our lives. And so I'm partway through it right now, but it's an inspiring book to kind of help push past this evolutionary fear that's been instilled to fear rejection. Mm. And so it's been an interesting read right now. Um, There's that's also a, a book one. called Push by Sapphire. Push by Sapphire. Huh. And what's that one about? Um, it's about a, a young girl who becomes pregnant at a very young age and it's, it's written in her, she, she hasn't learned to read. And so it's written very, very simply, very choppy sentences. And it just evokes a whole lot um, of emotions. And it's a very, um, very raw um, book about her experiences in life. And so difficult. I've actually only read it once because it's, mm. it's just, it's a book that really evokes a lot of emotions as you're reading it, but mm. it's very powerful in, oh. in the simplicity of it. Oh, thanks for those. Those are great. Okay. Now here's one last one. What's one piece of advice you would give your 18 year old self, the 18 year old Claire right now, whether she would listen or not, what would you want to tell her? Oh, that's great. Um, it kind of ties back to the book I'm, I'm reading about rejection, but I think mm. it, it and, and my brother who, who, who emulates what I hope to work towards, but it's just kind of, um, taking chances and, and, and not thinking about what other people are thinking in order to live my life and to kind of, um, not be afraid to make mistakes and, and fail and put myself out there. Mm. Do you think she would listen? Would she hear you? Thinking back on your eighteen-year-old self, um, would she listen? I, probably not. And I think probably with not. age and experience, I've 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 grown, um, and I'm still leaning into that, and I'm still working yeah. on that. And so probably not. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think that'd be the advice I'd give myself. 
Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yes. I like that. Thanks for playing along with that. These questions evoke yeah. a lot out from people and sometimes it's a little surprising and um mm-hmm. you know sometimes it's nice just to be asked these kind of open-ended questions and just see what comes up in the moment and thanks for um thanks for some really good answers i really appreciate them sure yeah i wasn't expecting them but those yeah, yeah great i questions. didn't warn you <laughs> i didn't i didn't do it so you can blame me well, Claire, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, you know, you're a psychiatric NP in Columbus, Ohio, and, you know, you've, you've, you've traveled this somewhat iconoclastic route to get to where you are, and you've dedicated yourself to vulnerable populations and underserved people. And, you know, this whole notion of medication assisted treatment, which I think is really important. And I hope if you can inspire other NPs to consider moving in that direction because of the opioid crisis in our country. I think that's an amazing thing. Even if one person takes you up on it and gets wavered, I think that's really wonderful. And also your work to support new NPs and their transition to practice. I think that's super important because their success is really important to all of us, isn't it? Like societally. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what's What's one thing do you feel like is most important for new NPs to realize? Like what's, what's a really central lesson that you feel like they need to internalize? I think for what comes to mind for me is, is value kind of recognizing or realizing your value and the value you bring, you will be bringing to patients and to healthcare financially and also just health wise. I think new grads experience a lot of doubt and unsureness Mm -hmm. and uh, there is a whole lot of value that new grads have right out of the gate Um, and I think that is really important to keep in mind that's really good and that's overcoming that imposter syndrome is a big piece towards getting to that Mm -hmm. sense of of one's own value so thanks for Mm -hmm. Thanks for mm-hmm. providing that for people, giving them the, that opportunity to learn their value. And I really appreciate you being here with us. It's been really wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nurse Keith Show. Remember, the show notes will be over at nursekeith.com. Just look for Claire Afwa Ellerbrook in episode 273. I hope you feel uplifted and empowered from this episode. Please look up Claire over on LinkedIn and please find her on Instagram, Facebook, and check out her website, NP for NPs, and refer others to it who might really need her services and her expertise. The Nurse Keith show is a proud member of the health podcast network at healthpodcastnetwork.com my thanks to them for their support the nurse keith show is adroitly produced by rob johnston of 520 hour podcasting and mark cappy Spiesen is our stalwart social media ringmaster and newsletter wrangler i'm grateful to rob and mark for keeping the wheels turning in the right direction before we say goodbye i'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes this one is by the musician robert fripp May my living honor my parents. May my living repay the debt of my existence. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. And new friend of the pod and my new friend, Claire Afra Ellerbrook saying arrivederci from? From Columbus. From Columbus, Ohio. Thank you so much, Claire. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thanks to everyone for listening, and we will catch you on the proverbial flip side.